Hello everyone, JL here. Oh, I see you waving, so that means you can hear me. That is always good news. Um, hi everyone, I hope you didn't have trouble getting in today. I was getting links ready, and then all of a sudden when I went into the newsletter that went out this week, it seemed to be going to a different class. So I had a few moments of panic. Um, sent out a really quick newsletter to 8,000 people, and here we are. So, yay! <laughs> um, so, if you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. I got a howdy from Texas. All right, tell me where else you're from. I see somebody from New York. Um, if you're new to Zoom, look at the bottom of your screen. You're going to see a chat button, and uh, you click that, and that's how you can talk to me. We've got NYC, Oregon, North Carolina, South Dakota. Yakima! Hi, Ava! Are you Eva or Ava? I think if you have Ava, but you might be Eva. Um, Erie, Pennsylvania. Oh, I love Erie. It's one of my favorite places. We've got Colorado and Canada. Okay, a couple people from Texas. So I'm thrilled you're here, you guys. Uh, my name is J.L. Fields. I am a vegan cookbook author. I am the founder and director of the Colorado Springs Vegan Cooking Academy, which has not had any, any in-person classes since February. We have all been home, and that means that we have been cooking together. So those of you who've been with me for the last, you guys, I think this is our seventh week together. Isn't that insane? Um, we decided one day on a Saturday, why don't we teach a cooking class tomorrow? And we did, and you all showed up, and you keep coming back. So I'm thrilled. In fact, we have almost 100 of you here right now. And so um, if you have missed the previous classes, you can find them on my website, which is jlgoesvegan.com. And uh, the, when I have been able to successfully record, which apparently I am today, uh, you will find those videos on YouTube as well. And uh, a couple weeks ago, we started to add a new element to the cooking class, which I think is really fun. Um, one of the things that my husband Dave and I have been trying to do during this time at home is obviously save money um, and cook at home as much as possible, which I know is why a lot of you come here every Sunday. But we also make a point to get out every week, well, except for that 14 days that we couldn't because we were self-quarantined, we're fine, we didn't get sick. Um, we have been um, trying to go out to local breweries as well as local restaurants at least once a week to try to support local while um, all this is going on because I'm really entrenched in the food and wine beverage um, community here in Colorado Springs. My friends are aching, their businesses are suffering, um, and I wanna do whatever I can to help them. And so one day my friend Jeff, who you have met over the last couple of weeks from Local Relic, I said, I was talking about a cooking class and I forgot what a smart like wine and beer guy he is and a real foodie. And I said, hey, would you be willing to make some suggestions for some beer and wine that would go well with what I'm cooking this weekend? And he's like, all right, something up. Do you want me to come? And I'm like, yeah. And now he won't quit coming to the class. Yay, Jeff. And so I'm about to unmute Jeff. And so for about five minutes, because I know you guys want me to get to the cooking too. So about five minutes, Jeff is going to talk to us about the peer, beer suggestion and the wine suggestions that he's made for our sauces that we're going to be doing today. And then I'll jump back in to do the classes. And so just a reminder um, that I will do my best to monitor discussion over here on the chat. Sometimes I get distracted and then I'll have to ask you to um, say things over again. But um, I'm going to unmute my dear friend Jeff so he can tell us all about the beer and wine. And I'll just say that I, as always, got started with today's beer choice from Local Relic. And Jeff, I'm trying to figure out if I've unmuted you yet. Let's see. All right, I think I'm unmuted. Yes, yep. good, awesome. Go um, well, hi everybody. Um, welcome back to another Sunday. Um, as JL said, my name is Jeff. I own Local Relic. Um, our venue uh, is called the Carter Payne. Um, it's a 120 year old stone church downtown and uh, JL has been kind enough to come visit us um, just about every week to pick some stuff up and uh, her and I were chatting before we got started on the class today um, just about how much of the soul of that building being an old church is tied to this idea of community and everybody uh, coming out and interacting and socializing and right now with this whole idea of social distancing the building doesn't feel quite the same. Um, but it's been uh, really fun to get invited here every week and get a little piece of that uh, that social interaction from you guys. So um, thank you and cheers. Um, as as I've done the last couple of weeks, I actually have um, three pairings for you. For those of you who are here in Colorado Springs, we're um, uh, 
recommending a pairing to go against one of our beers or pairing against a more widely available beer for those of you who uh, might not be able to source our stuff. And then we're pairing with a wine. Um, really, at the end of the day, it's important to recognize that beer and wine are just food in a slightly different form. Um, JL talks a lot about fermenting foods and, um, you know, the kimchi and all sorts of fun sauces and um, sauerkrauts and, you know, all sorts of fun stuff. And really, uh, all beer is, is just grain that has been fermented. Um, wine is just grape juice that has been fermented. So uh, as, as we like to joke in the tasting room, sometimes uh, beer has food value, but food has no beer value. And so uh, I would tell you, drink up. Um, so for our first pairing, this is, um, of course, I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't biased. I clearly am. Um, so we own a brewery called Local Relic. We brew 200 different beers per year. Um, every batch that we make is uh, small and unique and seasonal and intentional. Um, we're sort of the farm-to-table equivalent of a brewery. Um, most of our, our smallest batches are about um, 35 bottles. Our largest batches, and this is one of our bigger ones, um, range somewhere in the generally in the neighborhood of 140 bottles. This one is 136. I'll try and hold this up in case uh, you can read it. This says this is a Woodruff saison. Um, this is a Belgian style saison. This is brewed with uh, Woodruff and wheatgrass. Um, wheatgrass, you certainly know, I presume. Um, Woodruff, you might be a little less likely to be familiar with. Um, it's used. Um, really kind of from a, from a gardening and a landscaping perspective as a ground cover. Um, it grows sort of like clover, it hugs the ground really close, but it makes these really small white flowers. They're really pretty. Um, it was used, uh, well, and still to some degree is used um, as a medicinal plant. The flowers themselves will bring a little bit of kind of herbaceous bitterness. Um, this beer shows certainly some of that. You also get kind of some uh, some spice notes, some almost apple cidery kind of notes, um, which makes it a good pairing against a lot of things. The reason we picked this beer in particular, we're staying sort of in the lighter end um, because traditionally when you're dining, if you're starting earlier in a meal, um, you start lighter and as you work later through the meal, you work to heavier, whether that's in the wine side or the beer side. And so we're staying on the lighter end, but so many of the dips and sauces, the magic really is about getting big impact of flavor from a given bite. So instead of saying, okay, well, I'm gonna sit down and eat a whole big portion of something, if you're gonna take a chip, dip it in a little bit of dip, you want lots of flavor in a little bit of dip. Um, and that flavor intensity needs some flavor intensity on the beer and wine side to match. Um, and so while this is lighter in color, it's got like big aggressive uh, pops of aroma and pops of flavor on it. So, and like I said, I'm partial, but I think it's delicious. What, we're re what I'm recommending, and I don't have one here, unfortunately, um, but what I'm recommending, if you can't find one of these beers, um, most of the saisons that you'll find are on the lighter end. It won't have the big flavor intensity that this one does. And so we recommended um, either a double or triple IPA. Traditionally, they'll have more hot presence, so you'll get more bitterness, but very often the brewers will compensate with additional grain. And so you'll also end up with a bigger, maltier mouthfeel higher ABV, that um, same sort of lightness and color like we have with this beer, but also that same big uh, flavor intensity. We're uh, taking a little bit of a, a slightly different tack with our wine suggestion today. Um, this is, uh, if you've tuned in the last couple of weeks, you've noticed that most weeks I've been joining you um, from the church where our tasting room is. Today I'm joining you from home. Um, my wife talked me into staying home today because this is one of her favorite wines and she wanted to share the bottle with me. Um, this is, uh, again, if you can see it, um, the name of the producer on this is Bragans. This is an Albarino. This is the signature white grape of Spain. This is from a region in Spain called Rias Basas. Um, uh, R-I-A-S-B-A-I-X-A-S is the region. Um, if you can find this particular producer, B-U-R-G-A-N-S, this will run you somewhere probably in the neighborhood of $13 or $14 a bottle. Um, if you can't find this one, any Albarino will do. Um, Albarino is A-L-B-A-R-I-N-O. Um, they uh, sometimes will show a little bit uh, what the Italians call frizzante. So it's not quite a sparkling wine, but sometimes you'll get just a little kind of, a little prickle maybe of carbonation. Um, I opened this bottle about 30 minutes ago, so most of that carbonation has uh, 
kind of fallen off, but there was a little spritz of carbonation kind of on the front side. But again, lighter in color, some good uh, moderate crispness, um, what those of us in the wine biz call acidity. Um, but again, that, that big, bright, aggressive flavor, you'll get some um, apple, pear, melon, you'll get some tropical notes, but also some good minerality. It's a, a good, well-rounded wine. Um, again, if you're going to sort of work light to heavy, as we so often traditionally do, this is a great place to start. Like I said in the uh, little write-up that I did for JL that all of you got in the newsletter, um, if you started with this wine and just decided uh, to continue drinking it through the evening, it is food-friendly enough to pair with just about anything. Um, but if you started on this wine and never migrated away from this wine, um, I certainly couldn't blame you. And uh, my wife, Melissa, would, uh, would probably raise a glass. She would uh, probably do the same thing with you. And I might too. I'm starting with your beer, um, but I am thinking that I might have that wine with my uh, Tempe Bouillonnaise zucchini noodles today. Um, Jeff, I always love when you pop in because it's so informative. And I'm going to ask you one question from the, um, the participants before you take off. Um, Laura would like to know, what do you do differently to make wine vegan versus non-vegan wine? Vegetarian grapes. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so obviously, traditionally, um, if grapes are just fermented wine juice, then they're sort of inherently vegan on their own. There's one real step of the process where you can make decisions to move away from a, a vegan designation, and um, that's in the process of what they call fining. Um, and this occurs in beer too. Most breweries are really good about using vegan fining agents. Um, most breweries have uh, come into this um, world of kind of microbrewing much more recently than most of the wineries. Um, there are lots of options for fining agents that are vegan friendly. If you were to go back 200 years ago, obviously uh, we had a lot, our understanding of sort of that process of fining wasn't as good. And so one of the traditional ingredients that would have been used is fish bladders. Um, I would have to do some research and report back to you about what is sort of happening on a micro scale that makes um, fish bladders a good fining agent. Um, but basically that process of fining is increasing, is the process that used to increase clarity. So it takes any of that haze or cloudiness out of your wine as a natural byproduct of fermentation, you end up with lots of little organic compounds. Um, certainly, you've heard about hazy IPAs, um, but m many, many beers are what they call unfined and unfiltered, which as this one is, and all of ours are. Um, so you get like kind of a little bit of cloudiness on it. Um, cloudiness in beer is okay, cloudiness in wine, as you can see, this is like nice and beautiful and crystal clear. Um, that is, uh, the wines very often don't start like this. You use a fining agent that sort of binds to all those little floaties and pulls them out of solution. Um, so if you use a vegan fining agent, um, you can be vegan. But lots of places that have been making wine for hundreds and hundreds of years don't like changing their process because they appreciate that tradition and um, they like to do it the way that their parents did and their parents did before them. Um, <laughs> So true. And so, uh, um, yes. Jeff, can I throw out a, a resource? So for those of you who are new yes. to this, there is a, um, a website called Barnivore. So it's like carnivore, but with a B. And you can um, look for beer and wine and alcohol. Um, not everything's listed, but lots of things are listed and more and more are listed. So often when I'm in a, um, a liquor store or a wine shop, um, or a brewery, I'll just go on to Barnivore and I'll and put them in because I like stouts and porters and a lot of, um, I won't say a lot anymore because I'm learning. Many stouts <laughs> and some porters have lactose that's added into it. And so Barnivore has been a really good friend to, to me for that. But Jeff, I wanted to thank you. I know that people want me to get cooking by 115, so I'm not too far off. Jeff, are you coming back next week? Uh, yes, ma'am. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Okay, thank you. It's so great to see you, and we really appreciate you. Yep, thank you. <laughs> okay, everybody. So it's time to cook. Um, so what we're doing today, and, and Jeff, if you're still around, you're getting thank yous from folks in the audience. Um, and uh, what we're doing today is sauces, dips, and spreads. And so 
why this class? Here's a funny thing. So I've taught this class before here at the Colorado Springs Vegan Cooking Academy. My, my model has been um, that I teach two classes a month here in Colorado Springs. One is always free and one is always a, a smaller fee-based hands-on cooking class. And so I recently had, um, oh, my water just went all the way out. Um, I recently, no, I guess not recently because I haven't taught classes in quite some time. One of my free classes last year was dips, sauces, and spreads. I had like 50 people show up for that class. I, I had no idea people were interested in dips, sauces, and spreads, but apparently 113 of you are um, as well. So yay. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk you through a couple of different kinds of sauces um, and dips and spreads and really kind of like what the base is and then really talking about flavor. The one thing I hope that you've really picked up on over the last several weeks is that um, I'm trying to give you sort of something to build on, but then I want you to just kind of like use what's in your house, use what flavors that you like. And truthfully, things are slimming down around my house. How about you all? Have you been cooking out of your pantry over the last six or eight weeks? Um, raise your hand or give me a thumbs up or say yes in the chat. But I, um, I'm trying not to buy. Okay, so I saw Betsy says, kind of. Um, I've really, for some reason, this pandemic has sort of inspired me to think about my food a little bit differently. And I know that sounds a little weird, but since over the last couple of weeks, or I keep calling it a couple of weeks, it's been like eight weeks, y'all, right? Um, I um, joined a uh, farm to fork produce delivery thing here in Colorado Springs. So I'm starting to get my produce on Mondays. I've stopped grocery shopping weekly. I do it every two weeks now. And just about the time I start to put something on the grocery list because it's habit, I ask myself, do I really need it? And I'll go and I'll look in my pantry and I'll be like, you know what, I already have that. And I'm trying to stop myself for two reasons. Um, I don't know if you guys have done this, but I've definitely been trying to watch my money. I don't know what's gonna happen with the economy. I don't know how things are going. Um, as you know, I'm not teaching cooking classes right now, so I'm trying to be careful. So one, I'm trying to save a little money on my groceries. But second, um, somebody else might actually really need the can of tomatoes, right? And so, so I'm just trying to be a little bit more conscious. And what that means is I've started to be required to get a little bit more creative when I'm in the kitchen as well. Cause I'm like, well, I thought I was going to use that, but I'm not like, I always have a can of white beans, either great Northern cannellini, the white beans. I told you to, if you're cooking along with me today for the sun dried tomato, yep, don't have them. Um, and don't have them in my pantry anymore because I've been cooking the heck out of my dry beans in the pantry. So frankly, I consider this a victory, but that means today I'm using pinto beans. And so the idea behind this and my point for this is to say, these are starting off points and then work with what you got, right? Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's see if we have a few. For those of you watching later on YouTube, this is a live class and my focus is on the 100 people in front of me right now. So if you're a little irritated watching YouTube because you're wondering why I'm going like this and I'm going like this, I'm sorry you're irritated, but I'm not here to be a YouTube star. I'm here to teach these 115 people how to cook this week. And so you guys, let's see, I'm just going to check to see. Someone started baking bread. Um, and let's see, or somebody wants to start baking bread. And people have been dapping into their freezer or batch. Yeah, me too. I've had a lot of bulk cooking in my freezer. And uh, someone just made carrot top and Swiss chard pesto. That sounds amazing. Okay, so today we are going to make uh, a couple of things and I'm gonna start my sauce first. How many people are cooking with me? I can't see very many of you um, on here. So let me know in the chat, are you cooking with me today? Um, someone made pressure cooker lentils. Okay, so some people are saying no, some people are saying yes. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start with the uh, marinara sauce today. Then I'm gonna move over to the um, sour cream. Then I'm gonna do the dip, the, the bean puree. So just so you know what the plan is. And um, I'm going to do mine bouillonnaise style. As I mentioned when Jeff was on, I'm actually, you know, cause this is kind of how I prep for the week now is when I'm cooking with you on Sundays. So I'm gonna start my marinara sauce with a um, tempeh so I can make it a meaty tempeh bouillonnaise sauce. So um, for those of you, oh, someone, Tracy's um, ready. She's got her mise en place all together. Um, so I'm gonna start with the, the, the tempeh bouillonnaise. I think, I hope, that I gave you two ways to do that. And I'd love it if someone tells me yes or no in the chat. 
I um, hope that I offered you both a stovetop way to do it and the instant pot slash pressure cooker way to do it. Okay, good. So you guys know me. Mostly I'm doing the instant pot one. If anybody's ever been on the fence about getting a multi cooker, and honest, and I keep saying instant pot, it's not. I'm using my Melfi today. Um, my Melfi has a, um, oh, and actually I'll drop that link for you. My Melfi has an automatic function to do a quick release. So I don't have to think about it while I'm working with you. So I'm gonna drop some links here, and one of them is for the Melfi. Um, and so I'm gonna get that going, because if you've been thinking about getting a multi-cooker and you're like, well, I really use it, I can get this going now and not have to pay attention to it again. I don't have to stir, I don't have to worry about scorching. So, um, well, I do have to worry about the pot saying, why are you so hot? What did you just do? I been was boiling water in the pot to get started. Somebody tell me in the chat, why did I have water going? I know you, um, the tip link is incorrect. That happened last time, really? Um, let's see. I don't think it is, but let me try again, you guys. Um, sorry. Uh, there you go. So yes, I put water in the Instant Pot on high to get going so that I can get the pot hot quicker. So I'm going to use a little, um, olive oil to get started. You guys don't have to do that if you don't use oil. Did you see how much I did? Like that was probably barely half a teaspoon, by the way. Um, so I am going to uh, show you what I decided to do with to get this sauce going. So as I mentioned, I'm kind of trying to work through my kitchen, right? I'm trying to work through my pantry, through my refrigerator. I've been really focused on no food waste and using things in my fridge. So the recipe calls for, and I'll just look at it to make sure we're all making the same thing. <laughs> it calls for some garlic and, um, yeah, this thing got really hot. I don't think it wants to. I might have to switch to another device. Um, let's see. Sorry, guys. I might have to pull out another pot. I'm going to um, not do the saute function because it's already hot. Sorry. So what I just put in was a cup of red onion. I'd already had diced this week when I was doing food prep. And in that, I happen to have some mushrooms. So hey, guess what? I'm adding mushrooms and I'm adding some uh, red onion because that's what I had cut. So you can use any kind of onion you want, but I also wanted to use some garlic and I thought that I would pulled some garlic out and I don't see it. So let's just do that really quick. So um, this basic sauce starts with just a marinara sauce. And it's really simple. And it's a great base that you can add all kinds of things to. Sometimes when I'm bulk cooking, I'm putting a lot of garlic in here. When I'm bulk cooking, I'll actually add um, in the middle of the week, maybe some leftover seitan, maybe some leftover soy curls, leftover tofu. So by starting with a really basic uh, marinara sauce, you can add to it. You can add lentils. Someone said earlier that um, you just cook lentils. Adding lentils is a way to make a nice kind of sort of much more whole food approach to the marinara sauce that's an awesome way to do it but today i know that i want tempeh because it's going to be my dinner and this is going to be my entree and i'm going to do it over noodle noodles you know zucchini noodles so if if um tempeh is new to you uh the first time i ever went to a store to buy tempeh and remember in two weeks we're doing a tofu tempeh class uh the first time i ever went into a store to get tempeh <laughs> i said um this is bad. It looks like it looks like it's going bad. And they said, Oh, no, no, that's what tempeh is. I did not realize that tempeh is fermented. And we're getting a little Oh, um, Terry, I see your puppy on your lap. Um, you're getting we're getting a, growing a little mold spores over it a nice fermented probiotic food. But I want you to see what I'm about to do. I'm not going to worry about doing anything fancy. I'm just crumbling it with my fingers, because I want it to be meaty, right? So I'm just crumbling it. And I'll use a spoon to finish it off because I want those soybeans to kind of come loose and start to be the meatiness of my bouillonnaise sauce. Does that make sense? Um, any questions? Um, other people said that they, know, they knew that I was uh, heating up that water to make pressure come up more quickly. I just hope I didn't do anything crazy with my poor pot because it got really hot. So I'm crumbling this tempeh, and if you're not using the tempeh, you can just go ahead and get started with the other ingredients, but I'm going to show you some of the, uh, so I've got my tempeh, I got my onion, I got some mushrooms, which I think is going to be amazing in it. And by the way, if you want a meaty sort of just vegetable forward way of doing the bouillonnaise sauce, get some really nice uh, mushrooms, maybe even portobellas, and just chop them up um, just kind of roughly 
and coarsely so that you get those meaty bites of portobello mushrooms or shiitake mushrooms would be amazing in it as well. But in my case, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of all of that. So I'm gonna see if this guy's gonna let me start. Okay, that's good, so I canceled that. Um, okay, so let's go through the recipe. Now I'm gonna add, my, I already did my onion, and then I'm gonna start adding some uh, spices. You guys, you know I don't measure, and I wanna tell you that three of you sent me emails this week telling me how happy you are that I don't measure things. So for those of you who get freaked out, I did give you the measurements on the recipe, but I'm about to just throw some stuff in here and see what happens. Now, did you notice on the recipe that I said that if you chose to do the tempeh bouillonnaise, that you'd wanna double up your spices. Cause we just added more food into that, right? So we really want the richness of the basil and the oregano and the parsley. And I say all of that um, without actually having really measured. So I'm just gonna start scooping in here mostly to not put my fingers in. So I'm gonna add some basil. I'm gonna add some, um, this is Mexican oregano. It's just what I have right now. And then I have some parsley and some red pepper flakes. Who's using red pepper flakes? They're optional, um, but I mean, red pepper flakes is one of my favorite things to add when I'm doing sort of an Italian style sauce. And then I'm gonna do some, um, what do we have here? Oh, I've got some whole thyme, and I'm not gonna even um, crumble it in. I just want, cause I want sort of that, to bite into that texture. And then I'm gonna do a little black pepper. And then um, you guys probably, here, I wanna be careful with that because I've got the red pepper going on too. I think that's probably pretty good. And I got my garlic in there. And now I'm going to add just a pinch or two or three of sugar, because I love sugar in it. And then I'm gonna do some kosher salt because it's gonna be cooking in here and that'll get nice um, and set. And then I, um, the veggie broth I'm gonna use, I just wanted to show you, you guys know I'm a big fan of powdered bouillons because it's just a way to save money and not open up like a veggie broth that has four cups of broth and then I use one and I forget about it and it goes to waste. So I like the dried bouillon powders because then I can kind of control it. So I just use a half a teaspoon with this half a cup, which I'm going to put in here with my tomatoes. And then I'm going to show you that, you know, I called for, I think I called for crushed tomatoes. Well, I didn't have them myself. I had one can crushed, one cash can diced. Big deal. I'm using both. Moving on, right? We're fine. We can handle this. Now the broth, the reason that broth is in there I am pressure cooking this, you guys. And we talked about tomatoes, for those of you who are in the Instant Pot and Pressure Cooking class before. The sugar in the tomatoes can scorch on the pot on the bottom. So we definitely need broth in there with the tempeh while we're making this. We're doing it on low pressure, but there's still gonna be under pressure. And so I seen a good amount of liquid in here. You always want at least a half a cup of liquid when you're using your pot. And I'm just gonna go over my, I got sugar, I got, I got it all, man, let's do this. Okay, so in the pressure cooker, I'm gonna do three minutes, but I wanna show you guys why I'm loving this Melfi right now. And so I'll, I'll move the camera. Well, hopefully this thing works because I kind of messed around with it a little bit. So the Melfi, this new one, the 2.0, has a, um, let's see, go here. So when I put it on pressure cook, I can choose the level, which I want low, and then I want, what did I say, three minutes? Because tempeh is already really done because it's fermented and probiotic, right? So um, we're, we're basically killing the probiotics when we're cooking it. Um, so I'm going to go three minutes low, but then I'm going to choose pressure cook, or I'm sorry, pressure release quick. So when I toggle this, it's a natural release, an auto, which means it kind of starts going slowly releasing it or quick. So what this means is once this starts cooking, this is gonna cook on low pressure for three minutes, and then it's gonna do the release for me. I don't even have to mess around with it. But the one thing I have learned is that it's probably a good idea to just go ahead and put a little napkin or towel over it so that when that happens, it doesn't scare me too much because it scared me last class. I don't know if you guys noticed that. Um, so anyway, that's one of the reasons I love it. So um, uh, pressure cooker envy. So what questions do you have? Um, oh, someone must have asked about sugar being organ or vegan. Um, actually, that's not true that most sugars are not vegan. Um, because the times have changed and people realize that consumers are concerned about organic, etc. So um, there are some uh, huge companies that continue to not pay heed to that, but you would be surprised at the number of um, sugars that are actually vegan in your regular grocery store. Um, but for people who are wondering, um, 
traditionally the you know like in the way that jeff is talking about the finishing and finding process for beer or wine well sugar um bone char is a part of the processing for sugar or it has been and it, it still exists with some but you can go online and you can just look up um but i get mine organic from natural grocers or i'm sorry mountain mama here in um Colorado Springs in their bulk section because it's just easier and cheaper to buy bulk sugar. So um, thank you for that question. And are there any other questions about the sauce? Any who's got their sauce going right now? Who's doing it in their pressure cooker? I'm just curious. Oh, um, Jeff, I know I love Mountain Mamas too. Um, right around the corner for me. Um, okay, so it doesn't look like we have any questions about the sauce, but like I said, think of this sauce as just a really great base for you to build on. Um, I mean, it's great on its own, it's meaty with the tempeh. You can add leftovers later. You can add leftover roasted vegetables from another meal or grilled vegetables from another meal. And then two or three days, add that to your sauce when you're reheating it. And it's awesome. Um, but I got to tell you this with the tempeh, um, I've been doing the zoodles because I've been getting zucchinis in my um, farm to fork delivery every week. And uh, so I've just been spiralizing them. With, and then I, I saute them with uh, red pepper I, in a little extra virgin olive oil. And then I add a pinch of salt and some red pepper flakes and just do a really quick flash saute of the zucchini noodles. So there's still just a little bit of crispness because true story, I don't love summer squash. This is not my favorite. I'm sorry, I'm the worst vegan. I don't like eggplant. I didn't really like zucchini and I didn't really like yellow squash until I started spiralizing it and then just did a really quick flash saute. So I've got a little bit of a crispness. It reminds me I'm eating a vegetable and not mush. Um, we all have our issues. Mine's around texture. Okay. So um, some better than bouillon is the bomb. Oh yeah, for sure. Someone is talking about different kinds of veggie broths to have on hand. Okay. So now let's make some sour cream. Is that what we're making? I think it's sour cream. I was, I was confessing to Jeff, you guys. So a funny thing happened um, after the pandemic started. I got another book deal. So I've been working on a book that's going to come out this fall and I can't tell you what it is yet, but I think a lot of you are going to be happy and some of you are going to be surprised. Um, and so it's been a little crazy. So I was working on the book right up until about 45 minutes before this class started. And I was like, I need to reframe, get it together. So anyway, yes, we are making um, sour cream now. How liquidy should it be to make sure no scorching? Um, Vicki, that is an excellent question. Do you have tempeh in there as well, or is it just the um, the broth? Vicki's asking, she's just wanting to confirm so that she doesn't scorch her broth, or I mean her marinara. So Vicki, if you hear me asking that question, um, I'm not seeing you type back, so I'll check again. But you wanna see some, um, you're not making it now. Oh, okay, so you know, when I looked in it, I'm sorry, I should have showed it to you. Um, Basically, I saw a little veggie broth on top of the tempeh and the tomatoes. And so what I wanted, what when I'm putting broth in with my tomato, well, a couple things. I'm going to, since the other things are going to cook up so quick, I'll, or they're not, we're not even cooking them, so it's easy. Um, I'll take a little time. For those of you who are in the Instant Pot podcast, this is a little bit of a um, refresher. But with tomatoes, the, what I try to do is, depending on what I'm making, I don't stir the tomatoes into whatever I'm pressure cooking. I try to keep them on top of the food so that they don't get to the bottom and then they won't scorch. So that's one plan. But since this is completely tomato based, that's not an option. So um, it's one of the reasons I like to add something like either a cooked bean or the tempeh like I did. But then what I want when I put the broth in is I want to be able to see the broth, meaning the broth didn't just absorb into the tomatoes, if that makes any sense. And so all I can tell you is that when I looked at it from sight, what I was looking for was just sort of seeing the tomatoes and the tempeh just lightly swimming in the broth. And um, I hope that that helps. Okay, so we are going to make some sour cream. And I'm going to tell you a couple of things that might surprise some people. So I do have a Vitamix, it's right here. Some people use a Blendtec, but notice that I also have a food processor right next to it. So here's my um, confession. Ah, there are a lot of things I don't use my Vitamix for that I know a lot of other people do. And it comes down to if it's food that could get thick and with the consistency, and I know it's gonna be in the bottom of the, the Vitamix and with that crazy scary blade and I'm like goodbye hummus I wish I could eat all of you but you're underneath that blade right now like I do not make hummus in my Blendtec or in my Vitamix or in a Blendtec 
because I want the food. So I'm going to use the food processor. But today I wanted to use both devices because I know some of you might have a food processor and some of you might have a blender. Both of these recipes I'm about to make can be made in either. I would prefer to make my sour cream in my food processor because I want to get all the sour cream out, but I've come up with two strategies. One is, um, so, and so I'm going to do my bean dip in the food processor because I really want those beans to come out. But I'm also going to show you another way to get some of that food out of your blender and a different way to use it. Um, so I know that's a little bit of a teaser. And if I forget, I want someone to remind me. Um, I want to make sure, oh, we're coming to pressure. Very good. Okay. So I like to use extra firm tofu in my so it's my sour cream. Now that might sound a little weird um, or firm or extra firm because you think, well, you want it to get nice and creamy, but I want my sour, I mean, sour cream is actually kind of thick, right? So what's the great balance between the two? So you want your creamy sour cream, but you also want it to be thick like sour cream. To me, the balance is using a firm or an extra firm tofu. I'm using extra firm because that's all I had. It was in the freezer, I thought it. Um, but I wanted to show you guys I've in, in a previous class, and I'll do this again in two weeks. This is my tofu press. So I had frozen tofu, and then I thawed it, and I, it's been sitting here in the tofu press. So now I get to just dump this. Um, I don't know if I can really show you because I've got my monitor precariously over my sink, but I want you to be able to see how much liquid is going to come out of this. Not as much as you would think because I froze it. I hope this doesn't splatter everywhere. This is probably the stupidest idea I've ever think. Okay, here we go. There goes all the liquid. See how much I love you? I was willing to get rid of, like, destroy my computer monitor. Um, <laughs> so... If you've been wondering why get a tofu press, I think this might have just shown you why get a tofu press. Um, so the spring, because you guys didn't get to see this last time, so you'll see how this spring um, is what pushes it down. And so now I take this guy out, and now I have really, really dry tofu. And then remember, this guy um, is my lid. If I wanted to air fry this, I could cube it, marinate it, and then just put this airtight lid on top and it would stay in the refrigerator. So I'm gonna put this though in my, um, oh yeah, I'm using the Vitamix, even though I don't want to. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just sort of help it, I mean the Vitamix is gonna do its job, right? But I am going to um, help it along a little bit and just kind of uh, put it into pieces here. So, and look how, if you've never frozen and thawed your tofu before, this is why people, look how meaty it is. This is why it's amazing for air fried tofu. I wouldn't have worried about having frozen and then thawed tofu for sour cream, but y'all, we've all been home for a few weeks now and we use what we can. And I had a lot of tofu in the freezer, so that's what's happening. So this could be an interesting texture. Um, and when I say interesting, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be good. <laughs> um, okay, so um, any quite link to tofu press. You would think I would have that, wouldn't you? Um, it's called Tofu Express. I think someone might have posted it last time. Feel free if you guys want to. Um, okay, so for the, and I'll, and I'll try to find it while we're still um, together. So to get my basic sour cream going, I add um, garlic and salt. I already measured it out. So I'm going to put this in here. It's minced garlic and, um, and then my salt, my salt's in here. And then... And I'll show you the other thing. I confess this every time because there's no shame in my game. My minced garlic comes from this. I eat a lot of garlic and I'm not gonna spend my life peeling garlic, even with a garlic press. Mama don't have time. Okay, so now I'm gonna add lemon juice and apple cider. I just kind of put it all in here together. And there's a chance that this might need more liquid. So now what I'll do is just have a little water ready when I start to blend it. So I'm gonna put this on and I'm just gonna go full force. You might hear a dog bark. Um, my dog, Harry, doesn't like appliances. So the, he kind of got adopted by the wrong family since my whole house is appliances. This is done cooking now. So it should start doing a quick release. So I want you guys to, um, do you hear that? So it are, it's, it's doing it on its own. So I set it for quick release. So I didn't have to do anything. It's just quietly releasing the pressure, which is super cool. Okay, so this is gonna get loud. You might hear a dog bark, everything's fine. Um, okay.
I don't hear my dog. Um, okay, so it's nice and thick. And so I'm going to just show you a little bit of what it looks like now. Um, let's see, I always try to get this camera thing figured out. There we go. So sour cream, right? So we want it to be thick. And this is gonna normally go right into the fridge. And I would, uh, this is exactly the consistency I want it. So I would say I probably put about, let's see. I probably put about a quarter cup of water in there when I did that. You could also do lemon juice if you wanted it to be a little bit tangier. But what I'm going to do now is let this sit before I make it into my French onion dip. So I just want this flavor to get um, kind of meld together. And I'm going to take a little taste and see what I think. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and you guys, it's not sour cream, right? But it does what sour cream needs to do. I'll do a batch of this and I'll have it um, as part of my bulk cooking. And then I'll do things like I'm gonna make the French onion dip um, right now, but then I can also do things like use it for a dressing. Um, sometimes I'll puree like some basil or a little kale or a little spinach. And so I get this like green saucy sort of thing to put on salads or to drizzle over um, steamed or grilled uh, how long can it keep in the fridge? Great question, Jeff. So um, think of to tofu like you would beans. And normally you're gonna wanna eat beans usually by three days, no more than five days once it's been opened. And once you open the tofu, same thing, which is why I freeze so much of my tofu is because I'd rather buy some and know I have some on hand um, than have it sitting in the refrigerator and then me missing the, um, the, the date. So I try to like, so, so anything that I cook with the tofu or with beans, I'm also going to use within three to five days. Some things with tofu freeze better than others. So once I've prepared something, I'll rarely freeze it unless it was like a baked tofu that I put into like a meal prep. Um, so hopefully that um, did that. So what is the word? Um, Oh, that's so funny, the vegan sour cream. It gets the job done, exactly, I like that. And I'm actually gonna set this in um, the fridge. I don't know if I'll have room for it in the fridge. I'm gonna put it in a jar. And then let it sit in the fridge for a few minutes while we're making this bean dip, just to let it gel up a little bit. And then I'm gonna make my French onion dip, which I'm pretty excited about that. I don't know if you guys have tried that yet, but um, so yeah, we've got nice, thick, creamy texture. And I'm just gonna let that sit in the fridge. And then I'm gonna do our bean dip. Oh, but I forgot, I told you guys I was gonna show you something very important. So let me show you. I gotta put the rest of this in something else. So one of the things that, as I mentioned, I hate is how the food can stay, like if you're trying to do hummus or, you know, something thick that's in the vitamins and you can't get all the good stuff out. So like right now, look, I still have stuff in here. I have good stuff. So what I'm gonna do is add a little water and I'm gonna put the lid back on. And I actually, Fran Costigan, um, the brilliant vegan pastry chef, who many of you probably have her books, um, she taught this uh, in, in one, one of my first cooking classes I ever took with her. So I do this, I almost tripped. Um, so I'm gonna whiz this up. And I'm gonna pour this in my sauce and it's gonna add a creaminess to my marinara sauce. So it's just a way to kind of get the good stuff out of there. And so when Fran taught us that, she taught us that because she was making yummy chocolatey stuff in there. And it's like, who wants that chocolate to go to waste? So she just put a little liquid in there, a little water and then blended it up. And then suddenly she just had a little bit more for syrup. So there are some ways that you can kind of try to reuse what's left in your blender if you are using like a, a blender where you can't get all that good thick stuff out. So, um, so I wanted to show you that. And then, um, oh, okay, um, Marie, is it Maria or Maria? Uh, beautiful name. Uh, someone likes raw cashew dressing. Oh yeah, that's always a good thing. Um, cool. All right, so now let's, um, while this is getting nice and cold, let's do our bean dip. So 
the anatomy of the bean dip, and I, I'm actually going to stop, step back for a minute to make sure that you understood the recipes and why I set them up the way I did. So um, with the, uh, someone does that with their marinara jars. Good, yeah, good job, Pam, putting water in to get all the good sauce out. Um, so I wanted to give you bases for your sauces. And I want to back up for a minute too, just to say, so why are so many people interested in sauces, dips, and spreads when it comes to vegan cooking? And my thinking is, one, I think just all of us are curious cooks anyway. So whether we're cooking vegan or not, who doesn't want to have some, you know, some new tips and, and tools in the kitchen. But I do think that dips and sauces and spreads are ways for us to get creative with some of the foods that we're wanting to eat in our diet um, and then just give us a little texture variety. So what I mean by that is we've talked before, like in the vegan pantry basics class about, you know, eating vegan or plant-based, it's pretty basic, right? It's beans, greens, and grains. And, you know, what I mean by that is like basically any kind of bean or legume. Um, it could be any grain or starchy vegetable. And then just like the abundance of fruits and veggies. But sometimes we do kind of maybe get in a little rut and we're eating the same thing over and over again. We do all the time. No shame in our game. We have tofu and air fried potatoes at least twice a week because it's easy. It's routine. You know, we're used to it. I think we all do that. So sometimes if we're trying to add a little variety, there are ways to add some of these foods that we want to eat into sauces, dips, and spreads. And so like with the marinara sauce, I mean, who doesn't like pasta? Or even if, you know, like tonight, I mean, I, I want the pasta, but I'm going to eat the zucchini noodles, whatever. Um, so, you know, but I'm going to have a really hearty tempeh um, bolognese, and it turns it into a filling protein-rich meal, right? Um, the sour cream, someone said... Um, you like cashews. Me too. Love cashews. Uh, tofu has more protein and tofu has, um, has less calories per, per, you know, when you're talking about like by a cup. And so it's something that I'm going to use often for me. That's my preference, which isn't to say that, that a ca a amazing cashew sauce can't do that as well, but that we want to start thinking about these things. I love to use nuts and seeds and sauces and spreads because nuts and seeds are an important part of our diet as well. And so, you know, like to put some sunflower seeds in, um, a food processor with maybe just a lime juice or lemon juice, and then just let it go for a few minutes. It basically turns into a sun, uh, a sunflower burr which is just an awesome way for us to get seeds and add some variety. And so in the same way, um, that's how I approach some of these bean dips. So it's like, okay, I'm eating beans three times a day. It's a you know, plant-based diet. I'm either eating say tan, tempeh, edamame, tofu, or even a bean and I'm eating it, right? So here's a way to take the bean and change the texture, change the flavor, and change the way you serve it, the way you eat it. And so we're gonna start, well, you guys are going to start if you are, who's making this with me oh someone said umami exactly um because the basis of these recipes start with here's here's the the um the blank canvas we have our sour cream now what do you want to do with it you're going to make french onion french onion dip with this bean dip we're going to start with the beans but then we're gonna add the side tomatoes and that brings umami. There are other things you could add if you didn't wanna use um, sun-dried tomatoes. You could add soy sauce to the beans. You could add mushrooms, dried that you've rehydrated or reconstituted with some warm water or broth, fresh mushrooms. You could, um, let's see. Is there somebody, I'm sorry, what's going on? Is somebody having trouble with their own? A lot of static. Interesting. Um, let me shut everybody off and then. Um, okay. Sorry for everybody. Um, let me see if I turn this off. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? I'm doing it without my earbuds. Is that better? Okay. Um, okay, yay, thank you for telling me, you guys. Um, so I'm not sure how much or where we were. Oh, wow, it was really bad. Wow, so sorry. Um, so anyway, we with this bean dip, what we're wanting to do is add umami to this, right? So we're gonna start with um, pinto beans because I cooked a bunch of pinto beans. Uh, Dave, Dave goes to, I'll tell him, go to the pantry and pick out a dry bean that you want us to 
basically eat for the week. So even eating pinto beans were on the end. So that's what I'm using. Um, how many, is, is anybody making the, um, the bean dip, uh, the white bean dip? I absolutely love. And what I love with that white bean dip is to add the sun-dried tomatoes. Now back to some of the other things you could add. You could add black olives, you could add green olives or Greek olives, you could do uh, capers, roasted vegetables to add with your beans. Those are all ways to add those layers of umami that we talked about a couple weeks ago. But what I did was I have um, the, I buy sun-dried tomatoes. I told you guys to get the um, packed in oil. Obviously you can use whatever you want. I buy these because they are rather inexpensive, way more um, cost effective than the jars. And I almost always have them on hand and they are actually dry. So I use these for my cooking classes because then I can just keep them in my, um, my cabinet there. So what I will do is I will either rehydrate them with a little uh, vegetable oil or I will use a broth. And so today I just used the broth I showed you earlier with some warm water. And so these sun-dried tomatoes looked just like what I showed you before, but now uh, you're gonna see that they plumped up and they got nice and juicy just from sitting in about a, a half a cup of a hot veggie broth. And that's how I rehydrated it. So I'm gonna pour the broth and look how rich that broth is from the sun-dried tomatoes. The broth and the sun-dried tomatoes in. Now, if you were doing the base, you don't have to do this, but I already know that I want this to be an umami rich um, dip. And then I'm gonna add my um, garlic, which I already have measured out. And then I'm going to add my salt, which I don't know if I measured it out or not. So let's just do this. Cause I've got sun dried tomatoes in here. I'm gonna get a little sodium, right? And then I have a little lemon juice ready if I need to add some liquid for consistency. So you have to be a little patient when you start and it might be a little thick as it gets going, but don't, be, don't rush in too quickly and get too much liquid in. So I'm gonna start with this and I'm just using a basic Ninja food processor. And again, if you have a high speed uh, blender, now I know when I'm walking away, it's gonna be harder when you can hear me. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, oh good, Inka, I'm glad you liked the um, sun-dried tomatoes with the broth. Could you rehydrate with balsamic vinegar? Sounds like someone paid attention in the umami class. That would be brilliant to rehydrate that. I mean, then you basically just made yourself a balsamic sun-dried tomato infused balsamic, right? Um, so now, because I'm not using my earbuds, this is gonna kind of be loud. So I apologize for that. And you might hear Harry, unknown. I'm gonna do, since I want a puree with the Ninja, I think I can just tell it what I want. And I want, oh, I want a dip. Let's do that. And I'm gonna have this ready. This is ready. All right, let's see what I have going on in here. Yummy, yummy, yummy. I want a nice, thick, chunky texture. That's what I'm here for. That's what I came for. So now I can just take this. I'm going to put it in here so you guys can see what it looks like. And then I'm going to tell you how I would serve it. Oh, yummy, yummy, yummy. Okay. So here is a spread. This is a sun-dried tomato pinto bean with garlic lemon juice, a rich veggie broth that became infused with the sun-dried tomatoes, and a pinch of salt. So what will I be doing with this? When I make a spread like this with beans and some form of umami, you guys know I bake sourdough bread every week. This is brilliant, slathered onto a piece of hot bread out of the oven. It makes for a great sandwich. You could take a couple of pieces of crusty bread and spread this beautiful dip over the bread, add some arugula. You know I love arugula because it's just got that sort of um, zesty, peppery taste and that crunch and have a perfect sal uh, sandwich just from that. I love putting it on um, tortillas to wrap up. 
I will make tacos with this. So like I'll put in, I'll put corn tortillas in the air fryer to get them crisp. And then I'll just put a bean um, spread that has lots of umami, especially now that I've done the pinto beans with the sun-dried tomatoes. I might even just like mince up some jalapeno, some red onion and some cilantro and just have like a bean dip taco. Um, just dipping vegetables in is, is fantastic. And sometimes when I'm making savory oats, I'll reheat some savory oats that I made over the weekend and then I'll just put like a quarter cup or a half cup of this dip in it while I'm reheating it. And then I've just added some beans to it to give it some texture and to give it some flavor. Um, so how about a class on bread baking? Uh, so someone just asked about that. You know, I always joke that like I have been doing sourdough bread for um, three years. I haven't killed my sourdough starter, which is, I believe, a miracle because I can't even have a plant in my house. Um, I don't think I'm the best teacher on sourdough, to be honest. But I do think there'll be a baking class in the future because that is my next book that's coming in July. It's called um, Vegan Baking for Beginners. And I haven't really talked about it much in this class, but I will now since I just saw the cover this week and I wanted to cry of happiness. So the the um, there are two audiences for the book, for vegan um, baking for beginners, two different kinds of beginners. So it either means you're brand new to being vegan and plant-based and you don't know how to do baking with the vegan versions of eggs and butter and milk and yogurt, et cetera. So it's for the brand new vegan, um, the brand new plant-based person who maybe knows how to bake or maybe doesn't, but doesn't know how to do the vegan thing. But it's also really simplistic recipes so that if you're a seasoned vegan, you got it down, you hug all the trees, you go to your protests, you're like that vegan, 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 but you don't bake this book is for you too. So that's what that book is. So I do believe um, probably, uh, is it May already? Oh my God. So I think in June, um, one of the classes will be baking and I will make a point to touch on sourdough and just give you my layman's perspective on it. Cause as most of you know, who keep coming back here every week, I basically just cook with you guys the way I cook at home. And so it's nothing fancy. And so I'll just tell you the way I do sourdough and hopefully it will be helpful to you. Um, and it might not be. <laughs> um, so um, oh, thank you for the congratulations. Uh, so, okay, you guys are into that. So um, we'll do the baking class. Do you have any questions for um, about the, the bean dip? First, I'm going to take a bite of it because why not? But I just want you to see the chunkiness and the wonderful, wonderful texture. Mm. Oh, it's so good. I'm going to put that. That's going to be tacos. Yep, there are going to be some bean dip tacos in my life tomorrow. Um, Okay, so now let's, when can we pre-order? I'll let you guys know, you can't pre-order yet. It's not up anywhere. There, I think, well, they just gave, they just sent me the, um, the book cover to um, see and approve this weekend. I did. Um, so, okay, so now let's go back to the French onion dip. And we're gonna take um, about a cup of the sour cream. And um, see, look how it thickened up in the, the fridge. So it's got just the kind of texture I want. And I think the frozen, um, frozen and then the tofu is pretty good with this. So the way I've done the recipe for the um, sour cream is it's per one cup. So it's a lot. Like when you guys look at that, it was funny. I was measuring it and I was like, oh my God, the people who are really into this for their health are going to be so mad at me because like, you know, garlic powder and um, all this other stuff. Can we all just be honest? You had French onion dip, you knew what was in it. You opened up that little package of Lipton onion soup, whatever that stuff was, and it was basically a big old pouch of sodium. So there's no sodium in this, but we're going for flavor, and especially if we were having some people over who maybe um, don't do the vegan thing. So I um, pre-measured all my stuff before, so but I'll just let you know, so we're doing full transparency of what's about to go in here. It's um, some minced onion, so I just did some red onion, because again, that's what I had that was already cut, and it's like, why start a whole other onion when I still have some I need? And then I have my dried parsley, I have salt, I have garlic powder, I have onion powder. And so this is gonna go in as well. And then I'll just bring this up so you can see what I'm doing. And then I'm just gonna mix this together with my sour cream, because I want that, that you want that, um, the dried parsley, the reason I love this in it is because it kind of gives you that texture of some of those granules that you got from that Lipton. I mean, maybe it's just me. I don't know. Did you guys grow up with that Lipton stuff? I did. Um, I loved it, actually. And they're actually, um, 
it might even be vegan now that I think about it. But this is just a way to use your own spices. So it's that simple, you guys. And I'm going to put a baby carrot in it. And I feel bad because the baby carrots are my dog carries. But he's just going to have to forgive me. And then I'm going to dip one in so you can see my French onion dip. Excuse me. Okay. So what about dehydrated scallion onions? Oh, to use in the, um, in the dip? That sounds good to me. Um, can you use fresh herbs? You could, but you know, um, one thing, I don't know how well the fresh herbs would last if you had it in an airtight container in your refrigerator for a couple of days, if you used fresh herbs. But also if you think about um, the French onion dip that you might have grown up with or that you bought, in the store, it's got that kind of like that texture you're looking for where there's a, like, you feel like you're biting into something. I think you would get that from the fresh herbs. I mean, why not try it, right? Um, could you use roasted red peppers instead of sun-dried tomatoes for the umami in the bean spread? Absolutely, you guys. I mean, roasted vegetables um, is definitely, when I, when I think of the things I'm going to put in home-cooked or canned beans that I throw into the food processor, I'm always going to throw garlic in. And I'm always going to have some lemon or lime juice. Sometimes if I'm feeling sassy, maybe some orange juice, but I want that acidic, right? And then it's all about what's that one thing I'm bringing in from a food ingredient that will pull in the umami. And it's either going to be um, dried and reconstituted or fresh mushrooms. It's going to be some kind of olive or capers. It's going to be something like a sun-dried tomato, or it's going to be roasted vegetables or even grilled vegetables bring out umami. Um, Oh, Renee is asking about freezing the extra. Do you mean freezing the extra sour cream? I'm going to say no. I think that the tofu will get too grainy, um, if that's what you meant, Renee. Um, let me know. And then actually, for anybody who's coming in, we're at 118. Um, so do you think it would work to freeze the extra? Okay, good. Um, good, Renee. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, give the links again to the recipes for people who are looking. Um, and you can start as, um, asking your questions here. Um, I'm also next week, the class is instant pot. Here's the, um, the link for, uh, hopefully it works. Um, uh, next week's class is instant pot 101. And so, uh, we're going to kind of go next level. And I think that the recipe, the main recipe, so let me know what you think. Actually, I'll be really curious. So we're going to do a couple things. Like I want you to know how to like do a yogurt. Actually, I have yogurt going in, um, one of my instant pots right now. I'm gonna have three Instant Pots going, and my hope is I'm gonna show you how to set up a, a homemade vegan yogurt on the yogurt function. I'm actually gonna talk you through how to make homemade tempeh if you wanted to, because you can do that on the yogurt function. And then I'm going to try to do some layered meals where you can put a couple of things together you might not normally think of, but it, to help teach you how to sort of think about different kinds of foods that cook together well at the same time. So like if you're gonna to wanna to do a grain and you wanna do a vegetable or a bean, like picking the right one so that the cooking time is right. So one thing doesn't end up mushy or undercooked. Um, let me know if you're thinking that that sounds good, but here's the thing we're going to try. And sometimes it works well for me and sometimes it doesn't, but you guys seem to be pretty forgiving. So I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do the pot and pot polenta um, and pot and pot. If that's new to you is people put, um, it's not, I'm in Colorado. It's not that kind of pot um, in their instant pots. Um, or multi-cookers, they put a little water on the bottom and put a steam trivet and then put food in a bowl and that's how you cook the food. Now there are a couple of reasons for that. That's how some people do desserts and I know somebody asked last time um, if uh, I was gonna do like a vegan cheesecake in the Instant Pot and I'm telling you, I made one once and I was like, honey, I just think some things just weren't made to be made in an Instant Pot, but I don't know, I'll think about it. But, um, but polenta, is a cornmeal is really challenging because oftentimes it can scorch and stick. And so some grains do better with the pot and pot method. So I thought what we could do next week together, and I'll send out the ingredients of course later, is um, make a cornmeal that is gonna become a cheesy dill polenta, but we'll do it pot and pot. So it won't be directly in the pot, it will be on the steam trivet. So you can see the process of putting a bowl in your instant pot and then cooking with it. And we'll see if it becomes polenta. What do you think? Does that sound good? Um, oh, well, thank you. That's very sweet of you, Beverly, for asking. This is the tip. I hope it's working um, for tips. I appreciate it. Um, that I, I, I will tell you, 
you guys really have helped me immensely by doing the tips because every weekend I'm like, Oh my God, should I be doing this? I should be working on the book. And, um, and then you guys remind me that it's valuable to you and you're helping me and you're helping me use my time doing the things that I love to do. So I do appreciate you for that. Um, and then um, the week after we're doing tofu and tempeh, sort of a all everything you wanted to know about tofu and tempeh. So we're going to dive deeper into this whole pressing thing. We're going to talk about marinating, um, different ways to use tempeh, how to steam tempeh first, because some people don't really love it. But if you steam it, it's actually a great way for it to start to be a little bit little less bitter and changes the consistency and then it, you'll get to the point where you love it and you'll eat it out of the package but you know it's baby steps right and then um i think those are the only two classes i have scheduled now but it sounds like i need to get a baking one on um for sure and maybe um, one quick question was a marinara natural or quick release i forgot to show you the marinara oh my gosh it was not it was quick <laughs> and it was quick the good news is it was quick because um I'm so glad you asked me that question. It was like, um, hello, could you get back to the first recipe you're making crazy lady? Um, so here's my beautiful, beautiful meaty. I'm just gonna let you see it right here. So the reason it's low, um, I'm gonna give you a little 101 again on the Instant Pot and pressure cooking. A lot of times the reason we're using a low pressure when we're cooking and a quick release, it's usually for fruits and vegetables, but also often for things that are sort of already cooked. So they don't really need to cook cook. You're doing it to meld flavors. That would be a low pressure and a quick release. Uh, high pressure and a natural release is what we tend to use for beans and grains, for hardier cooking foods. Um, that natural release process, they're still cooking. So it's an important and integral part of the process. Now, in this case, we weren't doing low pressure because we were worried that the broccoli would get mushy or the green beans would be overdone or the cauliflower would get mushy. We're doing it because it's kind of already cooked anyway. So we were doing it for flavors. And so um, even though I forgot, but remember I had done the, I had set the, the pot to do its own quick release. So it did release it. But I want you to see how beautiful this sauce came out and then I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with that little extra sour cream. So here's the texture of my needy, needy marinara sauce. Look at those beautiful chunks. But now what I'm going to do, and then what I'm going to do is put this on saute. So that extra sour cream that I had that was left and I used the water, I'm just putting this in here. Think of it like if you were doing like a, um, like a vodka uh, sauce for pasta. Well, here, I'll let you see as I stir it in. So it just kind of changes the color a little bit. It's adding some creaminess, put a little bit more flavor in there, but the pot is still on warm. So I'm just going to put it back in there, but look how that just changed a little bit of the sauce as well. But tempeh for bouillonnaise is like one of my favorite ways. And then someone asked me, mentioned my, um, Yes, you can use your, your regular pressure cooker. I'll get to that in a minute. Someone asked about my t-shirts. You guys have noticed I've tried to have a really good vegan t-shirt on every weekend. And so today, vegan for the animals. And this is from um, Compassionate Company. Um, it's uh, Andy Tabar's company. And he and Paul have a podcast called The Bearded Vegans, which is really awesome. If you don't listen to it, I highly recommend it. And, um, and actually, Andy got COVID-19. And he's in recovery right now. Um, with his parents, but also he makes his living going to veg fests and selling um, awesome shirts like this. And Andy may not work again in 2020 um, because the veg fests are all getting canceled left and right. If you're in Colorado, I don't know if you heard our veg fest was canceled. Um, and so if you're in the market for getting some awesome vegan message wear, I really want to encourage you to look up the Compassionate Company. Um, it's called Compassionate Company, sorry, CompassionCo.com. That would be a really amazing way to support a fellow vegan who's um, going through a really, really rough time um, due to the pandemic, um, not only getting it himself, but being unable to work as a result of it. So I just wanted to thank you, Laura, for putting that link. Um, do I, I use soy curls or to TVP and bouillonnaise? Yes and yes. Soy curls and TVP both work brilliant for, um, for a bouillonnaise sauce. And I would rehydrate the soy curls before I put it in the pot. And I would do that probably in a nice, rich, hot um, veggie broth, maybe even chicken style. And then I would chop them up. And I'd actually probably put the soy curls in my food processor, chop them up, and then put them in the broth. The TVP, I wouldn't worry about um, obviously chopping them up. TVP is, um, I might actually have both to show you. Um, yeah. 
So TDP will plump up like vegan meat when it gets um, some warm water or broth. And then soy curls are more like strips. Um, and so I would chop them up and add them to my bouillonnaise. And then I did want to get back to that question that someone asked and said, can I do this in my regular pressure cooker? Absolutely. When I do um, almost anything I do in the Instant Pot is basically pressure cooking, except for next week, because I know you guys want 2.0, so we'll do yogurt. I'm actually going to talk about um, the important use of the saute function, which I use all the time. Um, but you can do this in your um, stovetop pressure cooker. You just do, you know, how you do low pressure. For those of you who don't have one, you may not know that you have to control your heat when you're doing a stovetop pressure cooker. So you have it up on high heat, so it comes up to pressure. The immediate, as soon as it comes up to pressure, you have to find that sweet spot of lowering the heat to where it just gently maintains a rocking motion um, with the, um, on, the, on the pressure cooker so that it's just gently rocking and that's a low pressure. If it were jiggling like this, that's the high pressure. And you would only do it for three minutes. And then for a stovetop pressure cooker, you just hold yours under running cold water, uh, the lid and the pot, and then the pressure will come down just like that. So, um, okay, let's see. Oh, good, y'all are helping each other out. This is great. Um, any last questions for me, you guys? And I, um, I did wanna um, see, do you want me to keep doing, oh, I'm gonna answer that question, I promise. And I want, I want your feedback. Okay, let's, Okay, if you're drinking beer or wine or whatever you're drinking, kombucha, let's chit chat, shall we? Okay, so I have some questions for you. So I might try to remember to cut this off on YouTube. It might not happen, whatever. I do not have time to edit videos. I'm just like, I need an assistant. Okay, so two things I wanted to talk to you about. But that wasn't it. Um, what, were, what were we just about to say? Someone asked if I was going to keep doing the classes, and I want to talk about that. But somebody asked me a question before that. Um, if you remember what the question was, Tell me, but I will talk to you about my idea for the classes. Oh, I know what I was gonna ask you. Do you like the beer and the wine pairings? Is this something that has been fun for you? Um, I just wanted to kind of try to do something a little bit different and maybe expand so your culinary. Okay, I'm getting like lots of yeses and sures. Okay, good. And I really like, Jeff is such a great guy and he's just like so knowledgeable and he's a foodie and a wine guy and a beer guy. So I'm gonna keep bringing Jeff back. Awesome, thank you very much because I think he's wonderful. I see some people who don't drink, so that's cool. So, you know, have some kombucha or some sparkling water. Um, and so um, we will keep uh, doing that. And um, here's my question for you. So someone asked, am I going to keep doing these online classes? And I've actually decided, um, someone asked, where do we get the recipes you are making? I send them out in my newsletter, and I also post them in my Facebook event and on Instagram and somewhere else on Meetup. Um, I send a link to the newsletter. If you guys, um, let me uh, give you that link again. I, I tried to give you the link to the newsletter, but apparently I'm having trouble with some links right now. Um, so here's the link to my newsletter. Um, and what I do is I try on Wednesdays or Thursdays, worst case Friday, but I really try to do it sooner. Um, I send out to you what I plan on making in the class that we can cook together. And that's where the recipes are too. So, um, so if you sign up for my newsletter, then you'll get that. And then sometimes you'll get a crazy email from me like this morning, which was like, oh my God, here's the correct link. Um, okay, so someone asked if I'm gonna plan on doing these online classes. And you know what, I am. And I'm gonna tell you what I'm thinking about doing. So people had asked me for a long time and I'm like, Zoom is too scary, I don't know how to do it, blah, blah, blah. Well, who knew Zoom was gonna become like a word that like, like our grandmas know. I mean, you know, so Zoom is a thing now. And apparently I know how to do a little something with it. I might not be a pro. Um, so I want to keep teaching classes here in Colorado Springs. I mean, this is what I do. And um, at some point when the timing is right and I feel like everyone can be safe, I want to resume that. And I teach private cooking classes here where I go into people's homes. And um, I hope I get to resume that too. But I've had for years people asking me about online classes and I was like, Ugh, I don't know. And so um, this has been fun. Um, I've enjoyed doing it. I've loved the community that's been built. And I've had some, you know, you guys have been really generous with the tips. And then I had a, um, a couple, the first week, um, some people were very generous and um, essentially gave me the, the, the room to do this for a while. So here's what I'm thinking. Because um, you guys have been, you know, you're, you've had no trouble, like, sending me off, you know, like five or $10 and, and you have no idea how much I've appreciated it. So what I'm thinking about doing is that I'll do classes. I don't know if I can handle them weekly, you guys, um, but at least monthly, maybe twice a month. And what I think I'm going to do is actually make it a tiered 
thing where um, if you can afford $10, pay $10. If you can afford $5, pay $5. If you can't afford anything and you want to take a vegan cooking class, just select zero. Um, because I have a, 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 a faith in the community that somehow the people who can will so that the people who can't can still be a part of it. So that's my plan um, going forward. And um, and I might do some things where maybe the class is smaller, where we all can actually talk to each other. And um, that that maybe I'll do for like $15. And then maybe it's just a class of 10. And um, and we all like work, we literally all cook everything together. I can hear you, you can ask me questions. So I'm seeing that there are some opportunities for a hybrid of this. So initial thoughts when you're hearing this. Um, okay, so people seem to, okay, cool. Um, Oh, someone in Colorado Springs says the time works better for them. Um, and that'll be the other question, right? Like what, what time um, you guys have all been available on Sunday at one, but I have a feeling when we're back in the world, summertime and Sunday at one might not be the optimal time, but we'll get that figured out. So, um, so that is my plan. But as I've said all along through this pandemic, and as long as anybody in any state is still expected to stay at home, I'm going to continue to do these classes. And um, so my life, you know, um, you guys may not have noticed that. I got my eyebrows done yesterday. We're allowed to get back out in the salons. So, and then uh, next week's gonna be my first haircut in like 10, 12 weeks. So it's very exciting. Um, so some of the world is starting to open up depending on where we live and the number of cases in our individual counties. Um, but as long as some people are at home, I wanna give us all an opportunity to build community together, to continue to have social opportunities where we can see one another, um, to continue to be home cooks together. And, um, and hopefully if anything that's come out of this time, it's been, hey, you know, cooking at home is actually pretty fun, good for me, and I've saved some money. So maybe there'll be a way for me to do a little bit of both and I wanna help you along the way with that. So with that, um, if there are no other questions, um, Oh, thank you guys. I really appreciate your kind words. Someone just asked me to, um, sorry, send that link again. I'm always embarrassed to do it, but um, I will. And um, I will see you next week. Sign up for the newsletter so that you can um, cook with me next week. The polenta is what we're going for. A cheesy dill polenta is hopefully what we're going to do. Pot and pot in the instant pot. So remember, it is instant pot 2.0 next week. So I probably won't have alternative ingredients for you guys. So um, if there are no other questions, I'm going to bid you well. Have a great Sunday. See you next Sunday. Please continue to stay safe and well. And uh, thanks to our friend Jeff from Local Relic for popping in again. I'll see you guys next week. You're awesome. I'm actually going to change this. I want to see your faces as you're going. Okay. I'm just looking. Oh, look at you. Oh my gosh. This is so much fun. I'm seeing some people are logging off. Lots of, oh, someone had a black cat. There go people. Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, this is so cool. I never look at it in the gallery view, so I can't see who's all here. Aw, you guys are wonderful. See you next week. Bye.